Good evening, hello and welcome you all with the news today, our primetime destination news, newsmakers, talking points and we have a very special show today. We are calling it Unstoppable India or at least Unstoppable Indian Cricket Team but I'm calling it something else. Cricket as the great unifier. What is it about this sport that unites people across caste, religion and so much else? And the spectacular stories of the Virat Kohli's, Rohit Sharma's and of course Mohammad Shami. We'll tell you just why this sport is the great Indian dream today. And special guests will join us, Sunil Gavaskar and Dilip Vengsarka, two people who had a major role to play in Indian cricket in their times, will be joining me along with other special guests. But first, as always, it's time for the nine headlines at now. The countdown begins to the 2024 general elections with more state going to the polls tomorrow. All 230 constituencies in Madhya Pradesh to vote in a single phase. Chhattisgarh to vote for remaining 70 seats in phase two. BJP releases its manifesto in poll-bound Rajasthan. Women's safety, welfare, top of the agenda. Kier attempt to woo the woman voter. This on a day when Congress is Ashok Gelot and Sachin Pilot present a unified front with Rahul Gandhi with them. As the battle for Telangana heats up, Congress Chief Kharge to release poll manifesto on Friday. Union Minister Amit Shah to release the BJP's manifesto on 18 November there. 40 workers remain trapped in an Uttar Kashi tunnel as rescue operations enter the fifth day. Second pipe to create an escape route is drilled in. Delhi NCR continues to breathe poisonous air as air quality levels hover once again in the hazardous category. Our government forms a special task force now to combat pollution. External Affairs Minister... Jai Shankar asked Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau to substantiate Canada's allegations against India over Nijar's killing. Claims freedom of speech is being misused in Canada. Israel continues its operation against Hamas in Gaza's Al-Shifa hospital. Claims stashes of weapons hidden in MRI rooms. Palestine Authority condemns, calls it war against the defenseless. United States and China to resume military contacts after frosty bilateral concludes. U.S. President Joe Biden called Xi a dictator just hours after meeting him. And Australia edged closer in their chase of 213 against South Africa in the World Cup semi, hoping to meet up with India in the finals on Sunday. Okay, 24 hours ago, at this very time, I was at the Wankhede Stadium in Mumbai, around with thousands of spectators. And then an hour later, this country erupted in celebration as India reached the World Cup final yet again. It's 24 hours since that stunning victory in Mumbai. But I can tell you the flavour, the sounds and sights of that victory still resonate. Rohit Sharma laying the foundation. Virat Kohli scoring his 50th ODI 100. Shreyas Iyer scoring a 70-ball century. And then, of course, the man of the match, Mohammad Shami becoming the first Indian to take seven wickets in a World Cup final. All World Cup match, all of that combined to send this nation into ecstasy and leave us pregnant with the possibility of a third World Cup title this weekend. Is this Indian team simply unstoppable? That's what we're going to raise in the first part of the program. And then I'm going to look at cricket's unique powers to unite people and the great Indian cricket dream. My first guest on the show today is the one and only Sunil Gavaskar, himself a world champion, record holder of highest test centuries for a long while. Appreciate your joining us, Mr. Gavaskar. It's been 24 hours, as I said, uh, since we had that Famous Indian victory. Dilip Vengsarka will also join me later. But uh, Mr. Gavaskar, pretty special day at Mumbai at the Wankhede Stadium. Virat Kohli's 50th one-day uh, international 100, a record. Shami's seven wickets. Your thoughts, what stood out for you on a memorable day in Mumbai? Uh, what stood out for me really was, you know, the, uh, the overall performance of the Indian team. Now, the calmness with which they executed while batting or bowling, there was not even a moment of panic, even when that uh, Daryl Mitchell 
and Kane Williamson partnership was going on, which had a, some others worried, but there didn't seem to be any sense of panic in this Indian team. The captain was very cool. Uh, the shoulders were still erect. Nobody uh, was uh, nobody's shoulders had dropped. And when at the drinks interval, Rohit Sharma gathered the team together and said, "Come on, guys, one last effort and let's finish this." They came back and they took a wicket immediately afterwards, and that was it. So I think that stood out for me that overall team performance. That's that's really been the feature of India's uh, cricket right throughout this tournament. It's not that the batting has dominated or the bowling has dominated. It's been a total all-round performance, including the fielding, which has been you know pretty much top class. But has it surprised you just what we've achieved? I mean, to win, what, now 10 matches in a row? It's not easy. I mean, it's never been done in World Cups to, to win matches like this. The great Australian team, 2003 and 7, went unbeaten. But are you surprised? Did you think the Indian team would be as good as it's turning out to be? Uh, no, it didn't surprise me because over the last uh, couple of years, you can see that you know they have been looking to get the fit the pieces, and they've managed to do it uh, during the Asia Cup. Uh, you could see that they'd managed to do it, and and when Hardik Pandya uh, came back uh, to full fitness, then it was a completely different thing because with Hardik Pandya, he two in one player, he gave the team options. Sadly, he was injured, which opened the door for Mohammad Shami. Uh, but sometimes, you know, when somebody is waiting for an opportunity, like Shami has been. And suddenly to get it, he's grabbed it with both hands. And look at what he's hes making a difference. He really is the one who is winning the games for you. I, w I want to look uh, at two people who've contributed enormously, whose careers you followed closely, uh, Mr. Gavaskar, Rohit Sharma and Virat Kohli, both as leaders and uh, as batsmen. In a way, do you think Rohit Sharma has set the tone for the rest of the team by the way he's played, with his great fearlessness, freedom and ingenuity? By far the number one player uh, when it comes to uh, strike rates in the first 10 overs in the power play. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look at the way he just takes the opposition bowling on. Uh, and, and the best part about uh, Rohit Sharma's batting has always been his ability to pick that line and length, just that fraction early and get into position to play the shot. Yes, he is fond of the aerial shot, which sometimes if it doesn't come off the middle of the bat, is going to result in a dismissal as we saw the other day. But the fact that, you know, when he is hitting it off the middle of the bat, the ball is invariably in the stands. And, and, and that makes the bowlers change their line, change their length, which benefits the batters at the other end. So this is uh, where uh, the impact that Rohit Sharma has had can never be underscored. I mean, it has been an enormous impact that he's had on the opposition's psyche with the way he's gone after them straight away. The other one I wanted to speak to you, Mr. Gavaskar, about was Virat Kohli. 50 ODI hundreds is a phenomenal achievement and he's got them in in almost half the number of innings that the great Sachin Tendulkar made his 49 hundreds in. It just seems to me an incredible feat, the, the scale of what he's achieved. Terrific, absolutely, no question about it. Absolutely, because look, the next best is uh, Ro uh, Rohit Sharma with 31. So it just tells you the vast gap between uh, between him and, uh, and and numbers two, three, four, five, whatever it is. Because his century hunger, you know, people are run hungry, he's century hungry. And, and, and his century hunger is insatiable and that's how it should be. Every batsman worth his salt should put a minimum price of 100 runs against his name. And that's what he's doing every match. Yes, in this uh, this particular tournament itself, he could have got three more hundreds. He got out in the 80s. He got out once in the 90s. He's got out twice in the 80s. So he could have had three more hundreds. A couple of times he's gone past the 50, but has got, got out after that. So he's been in phenomenal form. And 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 he's made every, every uh, you know, match count. I, I want to turn also, Mr. Gavaskar, to two other headline makers who perhaps don't get enough recognition. One is Shreyas Iyer from Mumbai, proving all his critics uh, wrong. Made a difference yesterday, got 170 balls. As a result, India, instead of getting 350, ended up with a whopping 397. How good is he now? Absolutely, no question about it. But, but for his initiative, but for his, uh, you know, the, the impetus that he gave to the Indian batting, that during that partnership uh, with Kohli, India would not have uh, got even to 350. And that could have been a bit of an uh, issue. Uh, but his batting 
taking the bowling on and then going on after a hundred, hitting those big sixes, Rahul coming and batting the way he's did. So look, I think this is what I'm saying that over over this entire uh, campaign, uh, while the focus has been on one man, the, the, the others have, have come in and made telling contributions, which is, which is the reason why this Indian team is looking unbeatable. The other day, uh, Mr. Gavaskar also, you know, we someone mentioned our bowling. We are known to be a country that treats batsmen as gods. But it's the fab five of our bowlers in each match. Someone or the other seems to deliver. Yesterday, it was, of course, the incredible Mohammad Shami. There seems to be something special about the likes of Shami and this pace attack in particular. We've never seen anything like this. Very special. And they're all different. Uh, different in the sense when you see somebody like a Bumrah coming in and bowling, you know, with 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 an action which is probably not in the coaching box, but so so effective. And now he has added the outswinger uh, to his uh, to his repertoire as well, which makes it even more difficult to score off him. Then this the straight seam bowling of Mamma Chami, the accuracy with which he bowls, the pace with which he bowls, and then the big heart of uh, Mamad Siraj. So that has really kept the opposition uh, bat batters on tenterhooks. Yes, there will be the odd partnership. But they have been the ones who have come back uh, when there's been a partnership and struck. And in the middle overs, you've had Ravinda Jadeja and Kuldeep Yadav not just stopping the runs, but taking the wickets as well and setting the opposition back. So it really has been a, a, a an attack uh, to remember. Uh, bat batters generally in, in a tournament, batters might, might win you the matches, uh, as we saw with the Maxwell scoring the runs that he did. But it is at the end of the day, it is bowlers who will win you the tournaments. I want to ask you a question that I know you've written in the past about a lot of foreign journalists have come to the country and said this entire tournament is almost being fixed, rigged to ensure that India wins. What do you say today to those who seem to have these conspiracy theories that everything is being fixed from pitches to uh, the playing conditions? How do you respond? What should one be telling them? Nothing excepting, you know, I mean, get out of that, uh, you know, yellow fever that you guys have about India and uh, start to smell the coffee. Uh, and and, and, and uh, when, you, when you talk about coffee, not the Brazilian coffee, but the Nilgiri coffee, start to smell the coffee. There was a time when you guys were the, the bosses and you could do whatever you wanted. Now it is India which is uh, running the, uh, run, uh, ruling the roost uh, and you better be uh, prepared to accept it. There was a time when you guys did not even want India to come to play for, uh, in your countries, you know, because Indians were not very attractive. Now you're falling all over yourselves to have India coming in. Now suddenly from three test matches, you increase India's test matches to four test matches. Now suddenly from four test matches, you've increased it to five test matches because every test match, extra test match with India gives you television revenue. And that is the thing about the, this foreign uh, you know, journalist, which actually uh, baffles me, is that they're quite happy with their cricket boards making money out of Indian cricket. But if Indian book, cricket board can't make money out of Indian cricket. That is, that is, that seems to be the case. And this thing about, you know, trying to how, how at the end of the day, whatever, whatever the, uh, the, the uh, situation about, about the pitches or whatever they are talking about, you, if you want to be world champions, you've got to be prepared to play in all kinds of conditions. So the pitches that they were talking about, uh, the pitch wasn't changed after the toss. The pitch was there before the, uh, before the, uh, the toss was made. Uh, we played in, 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 in places where the, the stumps have been pushed back so that the good length spot, the grassy good length, uh, uh, good length spot would be more prominent by pushing the stumps back. But have you ever heard over these years, you follow cricket, where an Indian cricketer or the Indian media has ever complained about the pitches or conditions over there, we accept it because that's what that's the beauty of playing. That's a challenge of playing in overseas conditions. So basically, smell the coffee. It's it's Nilgiris. It is very nice. And go home. And maybe it's winter in your time. Go home. Tuck yourself into a nice blanket and watch India. So can I say from all that you're saying, smelling the coffee to the rest of the world, that India is going to win this uh, final? Is it a done deal? Or as the cliche goes, we're going to have to wait till that last ball is bowled on Sunday. Uh, you've got to wait till the last ball is bowled, particularly when it comes to the, to the, uh, to the knockouts, because knockouts are where the best teams are there. Uh, in the group games, uh, you might actually have a situation where uh, one team might be just that little bit superior on the day. 
but in the knockouts, uh, generally, these are all close encounters and no matches won or lost till the last ball is bowled. But India, your favourites for the finals in Ahmedabad? Can we say we are firm favourites irrespective of who wins Australia or South Africa, the other semi which is on at the moment? They, they, with the way they have played, certainly they are, they are the firm favourites. Uh, so it'll be, but it'll be a final, you know, worth going miles towards. Because believe me, that uh, you know, at the moment it looks as if Australia is going to get through uh, to the uh, to the finals. Uh, this is going to be an unbelievable game because you're playing against five-time champions, a team that knows how to come back from uh, almost impossible situations, who know how to play the finals, how to win finals. So uh, this is going to be a real, real challenge for the Indian team. But I do believe that Rohit Sharma's men are up for it. My final question, sir, bit of a googly. If there was a match between Rohit Sharma's men of 2023 and Kapil Dev's men of 1983, which you were a part of, who would win? Oh, the 83 team would win. So say that again. Not You're sure that the 83 down, team would, would defeat uh, Rohit Sharma's team, is it? Absolutely. Not absolutely sure. Well, Mr. Gavaskar, that's a big call. The men of 83 will defeat uh, the men of 2023. Either way, we'll wait and see what they do on Sunday. But for now, for joining us and setting the stage for this special, thank you very much, Mr. Sunil Gavaskar, telling the Western press in particular to smell the coffee. Nilgiri's coffee, as he added there. Okay, remember now, in amidst all this coffee that we are talking about, two cricketers who are like wine are Virat Kohli and Rohit Sharma. They're just getting better with time. They've... Virat has reached where no other uh, one-day batsman ever has. And Rohit Sharma is just uh, terrific at the top. I want to go to someone now who's seen both of them rise over the years. Dilip Vengsarka, legendary cricketer, stand named after him in Mumbai, uh, is someone who as chairman of selectors spotted their talents. Uh, you must be particularly proud of what we saw yesterday, Mr. Vengsarka. Thank you for joining us. You gave Virat Kohli that first chance in 2008, spotted him. What was so special about Virat when you first saw him? Yeah, actually, I watched Virat um, in an under-16 tournament in Calcutta uh, against Bombay. Um, and uh, he was very impressive. Uh, I think he showed a lot of maturity. Um, and of course, Mumbai lost that match, uh, but very narrowly. Um, you know, and Virat had uh, scored uh, something like uh, 60, 70 runs. But he was extremely impressive. Um, uh, he, uh, he was very mature for his age. And the way he executed his shots were absolutely out of the top draw. Um, uh, they were top-class player. Then, of course, um, the um, under-19 uh, also was the World Cup. The, this is the World Cup which India won. I think Virat played brilliantly. Uh, he led the set from the front. Um, especially against Pakistan, uh, I think he showed excellent temperament. Um, and uh, then we picked him for the Emerging Players Tournament in Australia. Uh, you know, um, the winner of the chairman selection committee. Um, and other teams, uh, they had test cricketers, but we had picked under 23 players uh, because we wanted to uh, just uh, build um, a very um, uh, extent strength, bench strength. And that's what we did. Um, and Virat was asked to open the innings against New Zealand, who uh, were seven test cricketers. Um, and they had scored 270 runs. Um, and Praveen Amre was a coach. I still remember I was there. Uh, and he asked Virat, Ki aap open karoge? He said, yeah, I'll open the innings. And he scored a brilliant 100. And not only he scored a 100, but he remained not out till the very end. See, that was very important for me. Um, he won the match. I think he could have, uh, uh, no, I think got excited after scoring 100. But no, I think you know, he batted till the very end. Uh, and he scored something like, I think, 123. And I was convinced that this boy has got a bright future. Um, you know, and given a chance at this stage of his career, I think he would definitely prosper. Bright future in 2008. But did you ever imagine that by 2023, he'd be scoring 50 one-day hundreds? Has he simply exceeded everyone's expectations? Is he just in another league? No, not really. Actually, when you see the skill skill level, um, you know, and mental toughness and everything about about the player, I think you pick him in the team. I think there are so many we picked, uh, but there are very few. Um, uh, I think 
who have gone on to achieve so much in international cricket uh, because of the passion uh, uh, because of focus and because the discipline and the fitness level uh, i think virat was simply outstanding the way he's played so far what about uh, the mumbai boy rohit sharma when you first saw him on the maidan what impressed you about young rohit sharma that made you also look at him as a future star See, that time I was with NCA as well. I think we used to spot talent you know, and groom them in NCA. Um, you know, and Rohit Sharma, I think was uh, um, I think one of them. I think he was 17 years of age at that time. Um, and I had convinced the Bombay selectors then that we should pick him in the team. But they had not seen him. I had seen him in NCA and he, he scored an excellent 100 against some team. I don't remember now. Um, and I was convinced that he's got talent. Uh, but uh, but how he develops uh, um, later, I don't know. The thing is that um, um, I think Bombay was playing against Australia. Um, they had CCI, um, and mm -hmm. I want to pay and I want him to play that game. I told our coach Chandrakant Pandit that you should include him in the playing eleven. But the unfortunate part is that he came without the kit bag, uh, and I asked really? him, "Why didn't you bring the kit bag?" He said, "Sir, um, I didn't know I would be playing. I thought I would be." Uh, I think 14, but uh, but I didn't think uh, that I would um, I'll play playing 11. And Chandu was livid. I said uh, I told Chandu uh, I said not to scold him. He's a young guy. He's a uh, I'm sure when once he gets the opportunity, I think he will bat very well. But he missed out on that opportunity to play against Australia for Mumbai. And um, then later on, of course, he played at for Mumbai and scored um, uh, 100. You know, and after that, I think he never looked back. He was simply outstanding. But again, you know, potential is one thing. Realizing it, Mr. Vengsarkar, is another. The Rohit Sharma that we see today, you know, scorer of double centuries in one-day international matches, someone who terrifies fast bowlers with just the way he plays his shots. Did you think that he would reach this level again? See, Rohit Sharma was languid, basically. I think he he was... Uh, of course, he was focused in uh, this thing. But uh, I think, you know, he... Um, I think he had in a bit, bit, uh, bit, uh, bit, uh, you know, of a led back attitude, uh, as you say. Um, uh, unlike, unlike Virat, because Virat was uh, there in the face, like you know, I mean, he was aggressive, um, he was positive. Uh, and Roy Sharma, um, and, um, the tremendous talented player. There's, 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 there's no question about his talent. His skill level and mental toughness is superb, and the way he executes shots. Is absolutely amazing because uh, uh, the short ball the way he faced, uh, I think uh, against all the fast balls in the world, I think he picks the length very early, um, you know, and he hits them into the stand straight away. Um, of course, I think Rohit, Rohit Sharma I did very well uh, in the IPL as well. Um, I think he won uh, uh, the IPL championship at least five six times, and that must have given, given him a lot of confidence. Uh, so what I feel is, I think Rohit and Virat um, are different players completely. Uh, and, you know, Virat extremely fit. Rohit extremely talented. Both are talented. I'm not saying that. But Rohit, if he works hard, basically on his fitness, he can play for the five years, maybe. Really? Okay. Uh, uh, just a quick word on another Mumbai cricketer, Shreyas Iyer, who I believe you know played the match-winning batting innings. Did you ever see this special talent in him? He seems to hit sixes all too easily. Uh, yes, of course. Um, um, I think he's very talented um, uh, and he's very good. Uh, I think the way he batted yesterday was simply outstanding because um, I think that that made things easier, I think, for Virat Kohli. Um, and he's a very good player. He's an improved player. Um, and again, I think uh, the IPL stint, um, there's a captain also has helped him a lot. Uh, it has helped uh, it has helped his confidence. Um, and of course, skill level, mental toughness is all there. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, uh, um, if we continue the same way, I'm sure that he, uh, he will do extremely well. I think as both of these guys. Let me ask you, if I may, sir, the same googly question I asked Mr. Gavaskar, which is the better team? The team you were part of that won the first World Cup in 1983? Or this one, which hopes to win it on Sunday? Well, very difficult to say because uh, I wouldn't like 
uh, um, I have to compare the team with uh, yeah, they, are, they have different eras basically. Uh, Eddie, Eddie was different team completely. We were playing in England. Uh, here they are playing in India. Uh, but uh, uh, but let me tell you one thing. Uh, in 1987 Reliance Cup, I think we were the favorites to win the uh, uh, the, world, the, uh, the World Cup, uh, and we played extremely well until till till the semi-finals. Um, the Pakistan and India were the finalists, basically. Actually, everybody thought they would come in the finals. Uh, but we lost in Mumbai and, um, you know, and they lost in Lahore. Um, and, uh, and Australia and England played in the finals. But having said that, this team is an outstanding team. They have won all 10 matches, I think, which is very, very rare indeed. Uh, because 1975, when West Indies won, uh, they had lost few games in between. Then again, they won in 79, but they had lost... This team has won all the matches so far, and and everybody's in form, and there's no player in this team who is not in form. Um, so, um, um, I don't know, five, six batters, you know, and two spinners, uh, they are playing a very important role. Um, you know, because middle overs are very important, um, and the way they have bowled so far, uh, they are really uh, outstanding. And then, of course, the fast bowlers. See, when Hardik Pandya got injured, everybody thought, Abhi kya hoga? like, you know. But Shami came back and he bowls absolutely brilliantly. Um, and the way he bowled yesterday, I think brought us back into the match. Mr. Vengsarka, for sharing those personal stories of the rise of Virat and Rohit and so much more, I appreciate you joining me too. Now, at the end there, Mr. Vengsarka mentioning the Mohammad Shami story. An injury to Hardik Pandya meant that Mohammad Shami entered the picture. My daughter, after the match, asked me, how does someone from Amroha, a small village in Uttar Pradesh, then go on to these heights? Well, the truth is, Mohammad Shami is one of the stories of our times. Truly inspirational. From the small town rising up to the very heights to now becoming the fastest to 50 wickets in a World Cup and the first to take seven wickets in a match. I want to look now at Mohammad Shami's story and then we'll look at just why this sport is such a great unifier. Take a look. From having thoughts of suicide just a couple of months back to decimating teams in the Cricket World Cup, Mohamed Shami has come a long way. The man who was not even a guaranteed starter in the 2023 World Cup is now ruling the roost. If it wasn't for Hardik Pandya's injury, who knows if Shami would have gone the entire tournament warming the bench given that he hadn't started in the first four games for India. Shami started the tournament bagging a Pfeiffer and right now, even that's not good enough for him. In the semi-final, the man ended up claiming a seven-wicket haul. The man from Uttar Pradesh's Amroha has left an indelible mark on the World Cup and back home, He's nothing short of an inspiration. There's always something special about Shami. His coach, Mohammad Badruddin, recalls how his skills would become the talk of every household in the village. In a game where the batters make all the headlines, it's a bowler who's single-handedly taken India into the World Cup final. Shami's spectacular run in the World Cup has now seen him tumble records left, right and center. In the semi-final, he became the first ever bowler to take seven wickets in an ICC knockout game and he's now just one win away from becoming a world champion. Sports Bureau, India Today. So does sport represent the best of India? Is Indian sport simply Indian cricket, simply the great Indian dream today that unites the people of this country. Joining me now to answer that question are four very special guests. Suresh Menon is one of India's leading cricket writers, has written some wonderful biographies. Shishir Hatangdi is president at My Sports and former in, uh, Mumbai cricket captain. Rahul Dikuna is ad man, the man behind the Amul ads. Remember the Shami semi-final posters that have come up? That's Rahul's creation and Mudar Patheria has, uh, is when he's not 
dabbling in the markets, writes beautifully on cricket, including a lovely piece today on how cricket unites the country. Therefore, let me start with you, Mudar, for a moment, because is that how you see it, that cricket is this great unifier? Mohammad Chami from Amroa goes to Bengal, gets his opportunity, and now shines on the stage, on the brightest stage. We don't see him as an Indian Muslim, but a proud Indian citizen. I think in a country where we are divided on virtually every aspect, every point, and every reality, I think cricket is not the biggest unifier. It is the only unifier. You may disagree that, that Charu Khan probably looks old, and I might say, no, 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 I think he looks extremely young. He looks like a 25-year-old. Uh, you may still say that Salman looks young, and I may say he looks old. But on cricket, there is absolutely no dissension. We are all on the same page. So I think it's the biggest and possibly the only national glue that we have today. Very interestingly put. Uh, I, you know, Rahul Dikuna, when you put out these ads on cricket, you can sense your love for the sport. Is it part of what Mudar says, that this is a sport that unites us, much like Amul Bhatta does? You know, you, <laughs> you are, uh, Amul Bhatta is in every Indian household. Yes. No, absolutely. Rajdeep, absolutely. I have a slightly... A slightly, I mean, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that, I mean, we were just rejoicing and I'm 50%, 70% sure we'll win on Sunday, okay? But I'm not, I do believe, Rajdeep, if you just go back slightly, for many, many years, we loved cricket. We do, we love cricket. But I think what has unified us tremendously are the players. Mm -hmm. I think Sachin was the first big superstar that unified we just loved him we just loved the way he batted dhoni i think did a huge service in making that glue stronger and i think virat basically has has sort of made us that 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 uh, has made us feel that as a country not only can we can we win but we can stand up to the opposition i mean too many too many teams in the past rajdeep were fabulous players but didn't sort of shied away from confrontation mm -hmm. so i would i would sincerely say that yes cricket is a unifier but i also believe that bollywood up to a point mm -hmm. was a great unifier till about four or five years ago till we hit the pandemic when suddenly i think ott became a huge thing and cinema basically both south and and bollywood is also a unifier i feel because we love Hindi film. Shah Rukh is a great unifier. Bachchan is a great unifier. Mm -hmm. So I know that we have a great feeling about cricket and I'm, I'm praying that we win on Sunday. But I think sport is a huge unifier. The Asian Games, we had so many, so many, so many victories. So I think the Indian basically is finding for something to take him out of his life. And so any victory I feel uh, is unifier. You know, let, let me take what you said in a moment to Shishir Atangdi because Shishir, you, you played cricket in the 80s uh, when India was just about rising as a cricketing power, one would say the 70s and 80s. Now, we're expected to win. Is there a self-belief that defines this generation of cricketers with these wonderful stories, the stories of Shami, of a Kuldi Yadav comes again, uh, from Kanpur, rises to the very heights. Each of these cricketers has a story to tell in a way. Is this about self-belief, about aspirational India at work? Yes, Rajdeep. I think uh, what has changed from my time when I watched uh, Indian cricket, uh, we were a little shy. We were a little shy. We, were, uh, we had a sense of inferiority because uh, we were not up to uh, the, the, the dominators of world cricket. And now what has changed primarily is I think cricketers have become financially stable. Uh, that comes with, a, with the IPL, of course. And the fact that, you know, they've got enough in the world, in the bank, to believe that they can, you know, look up uh, anybody in the eye. And, of course, they have the skills, they have the training. The game has spread across India, not only to the metros in my time, where it was Mumbai, Cal Bombay, Calcutta, Ch Madras, Bangalore. It's gone into, you know, the rural rural part of India. And, uh, you know, everyone has a story. Everyone is, aspires because they've seen stories like, uh, you know, whether it's a Shami, whether it is uh, the Pandyas, whether it is... Uh, 
you know, the non-metro cricketers to come up and, uh, uh, you know, uh, make themselves be counted uh, on the world stage. And I think the confidence comes from the fact that they've also been playing the IPL for now 15 years. Uh, they're playing with international cricketers. They know that they're no different. They have the same anxiety, the same insecurities, the same uh, tensions that, you know, when you play a big game. So they all understood that, you know, they're all human. And whether mm-hmm. you come from South Africa, England or wherever, uh, you have the confidence now to deal with all these pressures. And at the back of your mind, you know you're financially secure. I think it makes a hell of you're- a lot of difference uh, to, to your makeup. Okay, you're saying financial security has made a huge difference. But Suresh Menon, you know, if I look back to the team of 1983 that won the first World Cup, or indeed the first team of that beat England in England in 1971 in West Indies, most of the players came from the big cities. Now you have this small town revolution. Shami represents that. Amroha uh, to Calcutta and then eventually, of course, the bright lights. But there are a m- number of them. Mahendra Singh Dhoni, you could argue, was a pioneer as was Kapil Dev before him. Is that one of the big changes that you see, that these young cricketers now from the small towns come with no baggage whatsoever? Well, I think I think two things have uh, led to this. One is that uh, I don't think we've given enough credit to Saro Ganguly for actually encouraging cricketers from the less popular zones, shall we say. And the other thing is the spread of television over the years. Now, Someone sitting in, in, in the backwater somewhere can actually watch international cricket on television. He sees the players. He sees what is the, the kind of uh, fame and fortune they, they have. And this, this can be a tremendous motivation. So there are, there are these two things that initially start, started them out. And then there is, of course, the fact that uh, there, there is uh, money in the game, that you can make a living out of it. The fact is that out of even if out of, say, 50,000 people who play some level of club cricket in India or whatever the number, only 11 can actually represent the country at any one given time. The fact is that some of this, some of the fame, some of the fortune really has has uh, sort of percolated down the line. And there is, there is a, a, a strong belief that where it will ultimately win out, there has been politics, there have been post selections, there have been sort of... Uh, uh, selections that have to have been questionable for decades, but by and large, people think that if you perform at these various uh, uh, sort of age level tournaments, there is a there is a definite step step by step progression to come to the top, and and I think that's that's encouraging too. And it's not just that everything is concentrated at the top, nor is everything concentrated in the big cities. So therefore, there, there's greater encouragement for that kind of uh, when you have an early ambition. You know, the, those are all fine points. You know, I just want to tell our viewers, my late father played cricket for India in the 1960s. He's the only Goa-born cricketer to play for India, male cricketer. And uh, he never had seen a cricket match till he was 17 on a proper cricket ground, moved then to Mumbai. There was no television in those days, so he only heard radio commentary. But to take off from something that Suresh said, Mudar, it's meritocratic. You see, Indians believe that nepotism works, but on the cricket field, just because my father played, I couldn't play. Cricket doesn't run in the blood. You've got to be talented. Is that something that makes it so attractive, that you have all these boys coming from these small towns or indeed the big cities, uh, but make it purely on their own ability? Completely. In fact, I would go to the point of saying that the Indian cricket team is possibly the only visible form of governance public governance in India. And I would say the cleanest form of public governance in the sense that uh, you may have a team which is visible, but you know, there there could be nepotism. Political parties are opaque. There's so many aspects of public life which are actually hidden from public view. But this is in the open. And I think that the Indian cricket team is possibly the cleanest visible form of governance in this country. And to that extent, contains no quota, no uh, reservation, no uh, sifarish, no upar se call aya tha, ya upar se order aya tha. In this space, nothing works. So, you know, you know, I, I use a slightly crude term, but this is the America in India. This is where the land of clean opportunity, it's actually the Indian cricket team. You know, that, that's, a, that's a lovely way to put it again, that it's the land of opportunity. And, I, you know, Raul Dikuna, you made a point about Bollywood, but Bollywood, there can be nepotism. 
You can become a film star because someone in your family was one, but you can't do it in cricket. That seems to be, be make cricket so attractive to so many. Rahul? I don't know whether... Rahul, can you hear me? Okay, I, 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 let me try and go to Shishi Ratangdi with that. Shishi, do you agree with that? That, you know, that makes cricket so attractive. These boys, you know, there's no nepotism in the game. You get picked because you're the best 11 players to play for India. Okay, we're having a problem with both uh, Rahul and Shishi's line. Let me try. Suresh, you want to take that question? Yes, yes, Rajdeep. I think I think that is largely true, uh, particularly at the top level. I mean, the fact is that anybody, anybody can pick 15 players for the Indian team. I mean, my, my maid servant can do it because if you follow cricket for a bit, you know exactly who, who the 15, 20 players are who, are who are worthy of being in the national team. Then the, the, the rest is fine-tuning, you know. I, I remember Tiger Patodi said, uh, once I asked him, I said, uh, did you always get the 11 that you wanted in the team? And he told me, I, I made sure that I got the 11 I wanted, maybe not the 16 or 15. After that, I didn't care if this selector's nephew or that selector's wife, son or whatever, uh, you know, nephew, whatever work, I mean, came into the team, I didn't bother, as long as I got the 11. So... The, the fact is that even at that time when, when he was basically telling me that not all selections were fair, he was still he still had the fairness to say that, but I got what I wanted. And and I think currently most Indian captains can actually say that. It wasn't mm -hmm. always true, but I think it's true today. I think Indian captains gets get the team they want. And that's mm -hmm. that's a huge difference from, from the past. Shishir Arandi, nepotism. Is that one of the reasons why cricket is, you know, we celebrate cricket. Mohammad Shami's father worked on a farm, becomes a, a champion bowler for India. Uh, and, and I can go on and on with lots of uh, stories of these young players uh, who've, who've shone simply because of their talent. And the talent is now spotted, uh, which, which is part of the structure that we have, which say, like, Pakistan, which has a lot of talent, loses out in. Do you agree that that structure that promotes meritocracy at least at the top level, is what makes it Absolutely. so attractive. Absolutely, Rajiv. I mean, look at, look at, we won't be talking about, you know, farmers and uh, auto rickshaw drivers, etc., etc., if the performances weren't there. You know, these make great stories only once you perform and, you know, bring so much uh, glory to the country with your performances. And I think what has happened is your domestic structure is so robust. You have uh, enough talent scouts. You have enough opportunity uh, for yourself to shine, to for yourself to express your talent. And then you have the IPL. So you have every every stage of your career there is an opportunity and you cannot be ignored i just believe you cannot be ignored if you're mm -hmm. doing well in today's times and that to me is the biggest difference you know uh, today the stakes are so high at the international level you will not find any player making it to the indian team indian team unless He's got something to show in his CV as a cricketer in terms of his performances. And that, to me, has been the biggest change from uh, the good old days where, you know, okay, you had one of the odd guy going on a tour on a holiday uh, and coming back saying he's an India player. That won't happen anymore because, you know, a lot is at stake and uh, every move of every player. I mean, Mama Shami, to, to be honest, wasn't even in the, in the 11 in the start of the World Cup. And look what you're talking about. We're talking about a journey that uh, is going to probably give, give India a World Cup uh, 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 in, in the next couple of days. Right. Uh, Mudar Pateria, there's, there's the other aspect of this sport which is, which is fascinating. Uh, to me at least, is that it seems to connect in some way to people across class, caste, re region, religion. Uh, is that something that you think uh, politicians could learn from? You mentioned government, but people across spheres could lead when we sort of tend to label people. I, I wrote this in my book that when Shami is bowling from one end and Umesh Yadav from the other, we don't say, see them as Yadavs and Muslims, but as proud Indians. Is that something that that we should be, that our politi that makes these the kind of role models in a way? Well, if I expound on this, then there'll be a riot outside my house tomorrow morning. So I'll have to be diplomatic. But I will say that there's a lesson for this country. 
And what these 11 fellows or 12 fellows are actually doing, they're waking this country up. And I can, I can feel that there'll be some soul searching happening somewhere for people who've been rabid, for people who've taken very strong stances on other communities, on minorities especially, that somewhere they'll start feeling that this is the story of a modern and progressive India, this Indian cricket team. So somewhere, you know, these fellows have shown something quite remarkable to the country. They've actually, I would say, spoken truths to power, but it'll look like hyperbole. But I will say that uh, these fellows, these 11 cricketers have actually woken the country up. And I would say it's a very interesting twist of fate that uh, it's selected two individuals to principally one individual to play the role of that game changer. And I would also say that normally in the past, you know, you mentioned Mohammad Shami so many times, you mentioned Amroha so many times. I will say now that Amroha will always be remembered not as Meena Kumari's husband's place, place of origin, but as the place of origin of a great fast bowler for India. You know, just as Ranchi will be forever identified with Mahindra Singh Dodi, but... Rahul, give us the secret of all these ads that you do. You put up that Shami semi-final ad, what, barely a few minutes after the semi-final. Had you planned yes. it or what? Did you know that Shami was going to take seven wickets that you put out the Amul ad almost as soon as the game was over? So here's the, so here's the truth, Rajdeep. Here's the truth on national television. We did the... This is what I love about life and trending and stuff. We actually did the, we actually did the advert when we won the semi-final. And Shami, Shami won us the semi-final, right? So, so we said Shami final on November second, mm -hmm. and uh, there he is again. He's uh, so so critical and so fantastic, sort of getting us into the uh, getting us into the final. So it just seemed like prophetic in a way, you know that right. that you know it was. He's just been. He's not single-handedly, but his bowling has just been so incredible and what amazes me is the feeling that people have about this man because he really is an underdog you know he's really personally been through so much uh and there he is he's just getting wicket after wicket there's a, there's an expectancy rajdeep when he comes into bowl right i've never known a bowler who has that kind of he doesn't even have swag but just when he comes on it's the same expectation as when when kohli comes into bat and i've never seen that in a bowler and that's just, it's a remarkable feeling, actually. Oh, yeah, you're quite right. And I, wa I want Suresh, you to then sum it up. Because you saw cricket from the 60s, 70s to today. We've talking, spoken about self-belief, about aspiration, about financial security, about no nepotism. How would the generation of cricketers, you, you used to speak to the likes of Patodi and others, how would they see this team? Would they believe that these are spoiled kids who get too much money too soon? Or would they see them as proud flag bearers of that tradition that began in the 60s and 70s? Well, if you want an on honest answer, I think both. I think some <laughs> of them will see them as spoiled, uh, you know, rich brats. Others will see see them as a natural progression from their period. A Tiger Patari today will see this Indian team as something that seems to be a logical extension of the kind of work that he did and i think mm -hmm. and i think it's important i mean you you asked earlier about how how uh, cricket is a great unifier i think it's also important to remember that the great whatever is a great unifier whatever unifies people so so strongly is equally capable of dividing them equally strongly you remember what happened after 71 we, you spoke about 71 earlier when we went, won the west indies and they put up this huge bat as a as a mm -hmm. memento and then we lost in 74 in England 3-0 and and then uh, there were there were enough cricket lovers in, in inverted commas to to deface the bat because they thought now they had defaced cricket and and i feel i feel that it, it's going to be a great match at uh, in the final in a, in a few days from now but I, but i have only one one sort of request to the huge millions of cricket fans thousands of whom are going to be in the stadium all i say is there are two teams playing out there. It's fantastic to cheer the home team. It's great to get very excited by Virat Kohli and Shami and Bumrah and all of them. But please remember there are two teams. The other team is also deserving of cheers. They're also deserving of uh, claps and whistles and the works. You watch You watch when a, when, a, when a batsman scores a boundary against India. You listen to the deafening silence. I think there's something 
there's something wrong there i think there's 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 a, there's a cultural mismatch there we are great right. lovers of the game we are great lovers of cricketers but are we great lovers of cricket and i think that's that's something to ponder over that's right crowd behavior can be fickle remember people were calling for virat kohli to retire from the game of a few uh, not too long ago rohit sharma was being questioned shreya sayer was it was suggested was not good enough and it's all changed that's what sport does and unfortunately at times as suresh put it we love our cricketers and not cricket i want to thank all my guests for joining me uh, i guess i chose this topic today because i was at the wankhede stadium yesterday and i was part of that celebration of india's victory the only problem i had was when the dj kept playing music in between deliveries i just thought that was taking cricket into the realm of entertainment and not sport so that's